And week 11 of the college football season is upon us, and it is crunch time for a whole bunch of top 25 teams. We're going to do our best to break down a few of these big games coming up, uh, maybe a double-digit dog, maybe a sandwich, uh, a few best bets. And we're also going to do it on just the uh, most glorious day of the year. It is Marco D'Angelo's birthday today, so we want to welcome him in, uh, as well as Kelly Stewart, as we get ready, guys, for what is going to be a huge Week 11, especially when you consider the elimination game that's going to be happening in the SEC on Saturday when number 2 Georgia getting ready to travel to take on uh, Lane Kiffin and Ole Miss Coming in at number 10 here, something has got to give here, Cal, because whoever loses this game can kiss their SEC championship as well as their playoff opportunity out the window. So what happens here? Yeah, this is a tough one. I'm not going to lie to you. I'm trying to look at this game objectively and say, okay, this one opened three and a half quickly. Old Miss got gobbled up, and I thought, okay, fine, right? Old Miss in at 7-2. On the season, like you said, they're in the mix for a playoff spot. And last week, I had Arkansas. Woof. And Ole Miss just went in there and dominated. Dax- Jackson Dart, 515 yards, six touchdowns. I mean, like, it was not my worst pick of the year. That still belongs to Purdue versus Notre Dame. But my goodness. And then you look at Georgia, who just quietly just keeps dominating teams outside of that first half against Bama, right? Even in that second half, they came roaring back. Then they, a couple few weeks later, go to Texas, get a nice win. I want to like Georgia here big time, but I don't know how I truly feel about this Ole Miss team. I feel like I've kind of been on this roller coaster ride with them where I've been wrong betting against them and I've been wrong betting on them, right? Remember they lost uh, to Kentucky. I gave it to Ariel Epstein. I had zero American dollars on myself. I then bet against them at South Carolina, and then I bet against them at Arkansas, and I liked them at LSU, but it was just weird. It was just like, it's just been a very interesting year for this Ole Miss team, and I'm not sure still this late in the season who their identity is, and as I mentioned with Georgia, they played a really tough schedule. We know they have a great special teams, and we know they don't allow people to get to Carson back. So it's kind of tough because I'm going, all right, Georgia's the bigger, faster, more physical team. So why are they only laying two and a half points? And I look at the series and I'm like, okay, UGA is one and 11 straight up, eight and four against the spread. But last year, uh, you know, they just absolutely crushed. They were 10 point favorites in Athens. I don't know, Joe, this one's kind of difficult for me to sit here and and definitively give a side. I'm going to give a head nod to the Georgia Bulldogs here. But boy, does this one seem really fishy. Yeah, I I agree. I mean, listen, the one thing that nobody's talking about is that Ole Miss defense, and that is no joke. That is a very, very good defense, and they are going to be up against it. And it's Carson Beck and Georgia this week. Should be a hell of a game, though, as should Marco D'Angelo's big game this week. And uh, Marco, happy uh, birthday. Uh, I said happy birthday. Okay, good. Uh, we've got Alabama. Get off my lawn. To- <laughs> we've got Alabama. Daddy heard though. We got Alabama taking on LSU. Another one of these uh, de facto elimination games here, Marco. Uh, two and a half. I mean, this is very similar to what Kelly was just talking about with Georgia and Old Miss here. LSU getting points at home has always been a thing. I- is it a thing in this game? Yeah, that's the narrative, especially you forgot to say it's a night game. You know, mm. you, they never lose, you know, they never lose at night in LSU. But Joe, you said in the last game uh, with uh, Georgia and Old Miss, you know, an elimination game. Uh, I think this is the real elimination game. These both of these teams have two losses. I still think that an SEC team that finishes the season with two losses is going to be in the mix somehow. Because if you look at the SEC, It's loaded with top 25 teams, uh, and nobody's undefeated in conference play. So uh, a two-team or two-loss team could get their way into the national playoff pitcher out of this conference. 
which one will that be? Well, I'm going to side with Alabama. And what I'm looking at, and my biggest concern here with LSU, is are they going to have the ability to run the football successfully against Alabama? LSU, when they've stepped up against some other teams, have not run the football well. Uh, when they faced A&M, they were held to 24 yards. When they faced Old Miss, you just talked about their defense, they only had 84 yards. They played UCLA. Now, UCLA, you think about, you know, former Pac-12 team, finesse team, moved over to the Big Ten. They held them to 103 yards. I think they need to be able to run the football to have any chance in this game. If they become one-dimensional, the Alabama defense is going to force turnovers. I don't see them running the ball against Alabama. I like the Alabama balance better. Alabama's defense uh, has played well. Uh, they've got the better defense, and if you look at LSU, they got exposed to me uh, again that A&M game. A&M ran roughshod over them, 249 yards. That's a problem. You give me the better defense. We're not grabbing points in that one, as I always like with the better defense, but it's picked the winner basically at two and a half. In their last four games before the A&M game, LSU had allowed over 200 yards passing in four straight games. I see Alabama with their running game that's going to open up the passing game later in this game to get the job done. Give me Alabama. I got them winning 31 to 20. I'll lay the two and a half. Roll Tide. All right, rolling tide, says Marco, in that game against LSU. And uh, it should be noted, by the way, uh, the way it is set up right now, Texas A&M and LSU have the tiebreakers over Georgia, which is why it's important for Georgia not to land in that two-loss category there. Otherwise, they could very well lose the tiebreakers to teams like LSU and Texas A&M. What a absolute mess in the SEC. And speaking of messes, what in the hell happened to you, Utah? My goodness, one of the most disappointing teams all year long, the Utes, although they have been dealing with just a ridiculous amount of injuries. But Kyle Whittingham uh, just moved on from his offensive coordinator, Andy Lutwick, a few years ago. Uh, but nothing seems to be working here. It's just not been good. Now they've got to take on BYU undefeated, uh, possible Big 12 champion, as crazy as that may seem. That's exactly what BYU is in a position to do. The old holy war in Utah in this game. That's going to be, of course, one of the late night degenerate specials here, 10 15 Eastern time. No cam rising. You got Zach Wilson's younger brother there. He hasn't exactly looked like he has been lighting anybody up. Listen, Utah's defense, I guarantee you, will show up in this one. The offense, probably not so much here. And the one thing we can tell you about BYU, uh, and a lot of people are not sold on BYU's offense here, but I am sold on BYU's defense. I think this is a real uh, a real defense. I do think there's going to be way more running than there's going to be passing in this game. I love the under at 40 and a half. This feels like a 17-10, 17-13 kind of game here. I would be shocked if this thing is any sort of, uh, of high scoring affair. I think the 40 and a half is generous. I'll be looking to back the under in this one. And as much as I'd like to say Kyle Whittingham is going to have his guys ready, and he will. But this could also spell the beginning of the end for Kyle Whittingham. Maybe it is just time that Kyle Whittingham takes a page out of the Nick Saban's book and says, what the hell am I doing here with this crap anymore? This could be the final straw in what might be a retirement announcement sometime in the near future. Give me the under in the old holy war coming up with BYU and Utah. All right, week 11 of the college football season. It's hard to believe, but that is where we are at, and it is time to talk some gold with none other than Yanni the Greek here, VR. And, uh, boy, VR, crunch time here. We got actual, I believe, rankings yesterday for the first time in college football. 
which means, of course, everyone will overreact to who uh, number one through 12 is. What are the markets doing, though, early in the week uh, with all of these big games coming up? You know what's funny? Looking at some of these rankings, Joe, <laughs> and I'm going to continue to argue that it's nothing more than a popularity contest. Mm -hmm. The fact that you have Miami as the fourth best team in the country just because they're 9-0, and <laughs> when right now in a neutral field, Ohio State would be at least a touchdown favorite over them. Georgia would be at least a four or five point favorite over them. Oregon would be at least a four point favorite over them. Penn State would be favorite over them. Texas would be favorite over them. Alabama, <laughs> Notre Dame, all those teams would be favored over Miami. And you're talking to a Hurricane fan from the 80s. Mm. And I still say this is nothing but more than a popularity contest. When the dust settles, rest assured, best team in college football, Ohio State by far, at least two points better than everybody else. But I won't continue that argument, Joe, because things are good right now. Mm. The markets are popping, stock markets, so people are happy. Let's keep that vibe of, of positivity, of positivity. Going to hand out a, a weekday game um, that I keep seeing tonight. Don't know. This will probably be out by tonight, and it's Northern Illinois. Uh, Northern Illinois just continues to get bet. It's one of those where usually you would see two-way action on the money line. When Whenever the guys I work with could get plus money, on a, a, a dog and then they could get plus money on the other side they almost always do it because they bet enough that you can do it for a percentage of your bet meaning if you get 10 dimes down on team a and you get them at plus 105 and now you can get team b at plus 105 for 10 dimes why wouldn't you do it why wouldn't you do it you make a free nickel off of that regardless of who wins at pretty much no risk and and they do that over and over unless unless they think that the position they've taken is already so advantageous. Why get up every, any of that equity, even though it would maybe a plus EV spot. And that's what I'm seeing with this Northern Illinois side for some reason. A ton of love on the Northern Illinois side with no, no, no resistance on the money line. So that sticks out a lot. Friday, a, another game where it's going to be public, Joe's versus pros, as they like to say. I don't like to say that because it's just bullshit. But anyway, mm. Rice, Rice, Rice. Rice against Memphis. Mm. Memphis is getting a lot of love already. I was seeing Memphis, Joe, in money line parlays mm. from like Mac games midweek. So so they really think Memphis has no chance of losing this game, obviously. Uh, but Memphis is also getting public money. Especially as this line drops, you're just going to see more and more Memphis money. Don't be surprised if you even see people using Memphis on teasers. So, so Rice is going to be one of those that the wise guys got down on 11, got down to 10 and a half and 10. They wanted double digits on Rice. And I think the sports folks will be on the side of the betting syndicates there. Just like in the late game where it's been one-sided San Diego State from the betting public. But fortunately, the, the betting syndicates are picking off any of the threes. Threes, threes at plus money, uh, any rogue three and a halves, three at even money, anything like that. They're taking the New Mexico side, which is helping limit some of the risk for the books. But I think by Friday, that'll change. Because once you have those primetime games that are kind of like independent, you don't have a big board, it's a TV game, all the money's concentrated on that game. It's going to be one-sided San Diego State. At least that's what I've seen um, from earlier in the week. And I'm talking the ticket count is nine to one in favor, if even higher than that, it's almost like nine to zero in favor of San Diego State with the only money on New Mexico this early is sharp, sharp money. Real quickly, Joe, I'll go into uh, uh, some of the Saturday action mm. that I've confirmed are definitely legit, meaning I'll let you know if there's any resistance, but so far I've seen absolutely nothing from the other side. Cincinnati, Cincinnati minus four against West Virginia, and then they backed off. Uh, UCF, UCF at plus four, three and a half, plus three. Now they're favored. Now they're favored. Uh, uh, mm -hmm. Or plus two and a half, plus. You saw resistance, excuse me, at that two and a half and three mark, which is not surprising. When you see a line move so significantly, you're going to get it. But after you get down so much money on the, the right side, which is UCF, that's why you'll see someone loading on the other mm -hmm. side. It's almost like if you have a full position on team a and all of a sudden you could get such a middle with team b you have to do it for a part of your bet again they're, they're looking just to, to try to, to to profit it's not about picking outcomes it's not about cheering in games or anything like that it's using the market to turn a profit uh oklahoma oklahoma but as dogs and pick them that was it since then i think it's been piggybackers 
and even public money pushing up the Oklahoma side. Because I can tell you, even uh, guys that I trade information with, no one's laid the points with Oklahoma. All the steam that came in has been at, at plus uh, points, plus money, or at a pick em, not as the favorites. Same with San Jose State getting three and a half. That's the key number. They want it there with San Jose State. Three and a half, three and a half, three and a half. And then uh, Louisiana. Louisiana threw that key number. 14, not too key, but they opened it at two touchdowns. It got bet up to 15. 15 and a half, 16, 16 and a half. You saw a slight bit of resistance come in on Arkansas State. Then Louisiana got hit once again. So Louisiana definitely legit. And finally, not to hold you up, a couple totals that are definitely on point. Uh, over Navy South Florida from 56 all the way mm. to 58. Over Duke NC State from 50 all the way to 53. Over Utah State, 68 and a half and 69. And the only under is UNLV Hawaii, the late game bailout, getting that under at 51. So you can see most of the totals they're getting down on are getting out ahead of the overs where they expect a lot of the bias to come in from the betting public. So with those, the, the key to look at for Saturday or as we approach game day is the line continuing to move in that way or come back the other way. Like, is there any type of resistance on those totals? Because so far, it just hasn't been the case. It's been one-sided uh, sharp money. But I think once the public gets involved, they start pushing it up. You got to see some take back there. Yeah, uh, you're going to see a uh, take back, I think, in a uh, in a lot of moves this week as we get a little bit closer to Saturday, Yanni, which yep. is why it's so important to hang with us on last call on Saturdays, 11 a.m. Eastern time here on Wager Talk TV. And listen, we got college hoops now, Yanni, NHL, yep. NBA. How are you navigating all of this and what do you got rolling on your page at Wager Talk? Honestly, I love when it's this many markets because it, 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 it allows me to work with like more people. And what I mean by that is, even if one mark isn't running hot, the probabilities that others are, are greater. When you're just sat like focused on just one market, if you're not having a good year on that sport, it's gonna be a bad couple months. But when you're betting multiple markets, you could be having a bad season in college football, but beating NBA, college basketball, NHL, which you're able to overcome that negative variance even if because even if you have an edge in the small in the short term you're going to have some negative variance so if you're spread around multiple markets higher probability that you will be profitable if you have winning information in all those markets so i love it and more importantly for me i'm really trying to narrow down my volume that's been the number one goal because once 20 one one 20, 25, that'll be where i have 10 years documented joe 10 mm. full years in the books a big enough sample size that I now am just going to narrow down top plays. I want to see the most people I can help is by lowering volume. That's what I've come to the conclusion with and uh, been able to do that now with these multiple markets, just handing out mostly best bets. So head on over to wagertalk.com, jump on uh, the Greek gambler and uh, a lot of stuff for this weekend. UFC, no. NFL, college football, college basketball, NBA, you know, all that good stuff. Yep. Knowledge is power, VR. Nobody's got more of it than you, my man. So make sure you visit them over at wagertalk.com. As always, VR, we appreciate it. But don't forget, uh, smash that like button. Hit the subscribe button if you're joining us here on the college edition of Bet On It. We certainly do appreciate you hanging by. Become part of the Wager Talk TV family. And, well, here's a big reason why. No place else. Will you find anybody handing out consistent double-digit dog winners? Not like Kelly's been doing all season long. And Cal, you got what? This is ugly. I'm not gonna lie. This is whoo. Uh, what are you? What are you pulling for a double-digit dog this week? You're right, Joe. Last week we <laughs> cashed Texas Tech outright, and I said if their defense can come to play, they can win this game. They did get it done for us. Look. This week's double-digit dog, there wasn't a lot of options. Here, I'm going to read off my options just so you guys know what I had. Middle Tennessee, Georgia Tech, Air Force. And I thought, you know what? I should have bet Hawaii last week because they were on my list. And I didn't do it. And they were playing Fresno State. So who's playing Fresno State this week? Air Force. Can't wait. What a terrible reason to take this. No, and in all actuality, Joe, I didn't love – really much this week from a double digit dog perspective but air force has won the last three meetings here okay so 
Keep that in mind. And then the asterisk is they haven't played each other since 2019. And this has been a horrific, disappointing, ugly season, right? Air Force is sitting at just one win. But last week, what did we see from them? They held Army to a season low, 255 yards. And Fresno State hasn't been anything to write home about. I don't follow the Mountain West as much as I did when I lived in Las Vegas. So I texted a buddy of mine. I said, Joe, do you like Hawaii against your Bulldogs this week? And he kind of brushed me off. And I looked at it again and I thought, eh. And of course, Hawaii ultimately wins that game outright. Fresno is averaging a ton of yards, right? 317 yards per game in Mountain West play. But they're averaging less than that on the road. Now, on the road in elevation where it's cold already with a really good Air Force defense holding teams to 24 yards per game. I'm sorry, Fresno should not be laying double digits here on the road to any Mountain West team, even the Air Force Falcons. I like the plus 10. I think it's even 10 and a half right now on the Wager Talk odd screen because nobody wants any part of Air Force. I'll take it and don't forget, of course, to just put a little bit of a sprinkle in case that double-digit dog decides to win outright. Ooh, ugly, but you got to do the uh, the sprinkle here, people, for Air Force to get it done this week as a double-digit dog. And Marco D'Angelo, uh, Marco, there's a rumor here that uh, you've been having so much fun with those disgusting sandwiches uh, that you give out on a week-to-week basis here. Uh, making Kelly and I sick. Uh, you have apparently taken it a step further and opened up your own uh, deli of sorts here. Uh, what do you got rolling for us here? Yeah, guys, if you like this segment where we do the sandwich games, well, we've extended the hours of the deli. You can check out a video I do. It's generally posted uh, Thursday late afternoon or early Friday morning where I give you some other sandwich shop specials uh, for this coming weekend, and we'll even throw in a trap game or two there. Last week, we gave out five plays on that video, four in one. The deli was uh, very happy. They're lining up already for this week, so look for that. You can always find it at Wager Talk TV on our YouTube channel, and of course, I'll be tweeting it out. So if you're not already following me on uh, X, see, I didn't say Twitter, Joe. Yeah. Uh, X at Marco in Vegas. Uh, give me a follow. And Joe, for this week, uh, the deli, uh, you know, you guys have been giving me uh, a lot of grief with some of these sandwiches I come up with. Uh, this one's not that bad. They snapped that five game losing streak last week, and we're gonna go down uh, to your state and we're gonna take uh, UCF, Central mm. Florida in this one take them plus the field goal against uh arizona state and after losing five in a row they took out their frustrations last week they put up 56 in a 56 to 12 blowout of the other team from arizona the arizona wildcats and i go back and look at the five game losing streak of central florida and really if you look at it they played a tough schedule they lost to colorado who really actually is playing some good football they lost to florida sec interstate uh in-state foe they lost to cincinnati then they went on the road to iowa state and then they played byu at home iowa state and byu both undefeated teams at the time byu still undefeated in colorado as I said, playing well in the Big 12. So they played some of the powerhouses. Now they're stepping down. And where the sandwich comes in, Arizona State, with last week's win, became bowl eligible. They moved over to the Big 12 this year, and they're bowl eligible, and they play one of the better teams, uh, or at least was supposed to be one of the better teams this year in the Big 12. They stubbed their toe last week, uh, but they play Kansas State next week, and then after that, they get the undefeated BYU team. Uh, I'm looking for them to be a little fat and sassy this week and look past Central Florida. And this line should be telling you something's wrong here. It just smells fishy. You got the team with the much better record, uh, six and three, playing a four and five, or actually six and two team, playing a four and five team, and yet they're only minus a field goal at home. That should send up a big red flag for you. And that's why I am on 
Central Florida in here. They need to win two of the remaining three games to become bowl eligible. And this UCF team, they have run for 175 yards or more in every game but one. And as I said, Arizona State moved over from the Pac-12, a team, that, a conference that I've always said in the past was more of a finesse conference than a physical conference. I don't see them stopping this run game. I like UCF to get the job done. 34-27, I'm taking UCF plus the points, but do a little sprinkle as well. Oh, doing a little sprinkle there in the sandwich uh, game of the week. By the way, guys, check out uh, the deli link is in the description below for Marco. Make sure you check out uh, those videos each and every week. And as long as you're there, hit the like button and hit the subscribe button. Become part of the Wager Talk TV family as we are going to move on to fading Joe Public this week. And uh, I swear... I don't get it, but it appears that the public just loves themselves some San Diego State this week at home as a uh, field goal favorite over everybody's favorite offense, that being Bronco Mendenhall and the New Mexico Lobos here. And I don't get it. Listen, New Mexico just gave up over 500 yards uh, to... Boise State in what was an absolute beatdown. And listen, don't get me wrong. We all know that Boise State certainly uh, has quite the offense. But what people don't understand is how good this offense is uh, for New Mexico and Bronco Mendenhall. Uh, they are coming off a game in which, oh, I don't know, they dropped another uh, 40, 50 points on somebody. 94 total points against Wyoming last week is what it is. And in fact, when you look at the last five games for New Mexico, you're going to notice a trend. They're scoring 35 or more points in every game. They have a quarterback that is a wheeler and dealer, Devin Dampier. Uh, he is a guy that is just racking it up, guys. Nearly 3,000 total yards, passing the ball, and 23 touchdowns. He has also thrown 12 picks, don't get me wrong. But we're talking about a San Diego State team that has 13 total offensive touchdowns. 13. And they only have one running back that has actually averaged more than 13 carries. Uh, listen, I get off the beat down at home. I get, I get why San Diego State would be the favorite here. And I get why the public would want to back them in this spot because you're figuring... New Mexico's defense is terrible. Well, I got news for you. San Diego State's defense isn't that great either, especially against the run. And I don't understand. San Diego State hasn't scored more than 27 points in any game against an FBS team so far this year. New Mexico has done it four times in the last five games. If you're not going to stop New Mexico, that means points are coming. The problem is, I don't think San Diego State has the firepower to match New Mexico. I think they're very much a live dog in this one. I'll take Bronco Mendenhall. I'll take New Mexico. I will fade the public who loves themselves some San Diego State, not me. All right, time to talk a little T and A with the pen. Ralph Michaels here, week 11 of the college football season. Ralph, kind of hard to believe. Uh, and you are zoning in on, uh, this is an interesting one, Marshall taking on Southern Miss here. Uh, how are you leaning and what is the TNA with this game? Well, this is a Marshall team that I am going to back this week, laying almost two touchdowns on the road. That's not going to phase me. It's one of my favorite situations, Joe. We have a team in Marshall that is five and three. We have an established coach with Charles Huff. Have they had any bad losses? No. They lost on the road against Virginia Tech, where they only got outgained by 60 yards. They lost at Ohio State, not a bad loss, 49-14. And their only other loss in the season was at Georgia Southern. They lost by a point, but they covered that game, getting outgained by 33 yards. So you might say, well, Marshall is winless on the road straight up. But I'm going to say, listen, they're 3-0 ATS, and now they're in the role of an away favorite. 
They have five wins, Joe. So this, of course, means a victory here gets them bowl eligible. When I went to the database, when a five and three team, an exact team with a record of five and three, is playing a poor team with a win percentage under 25%, those teams have covered 60% against the spread. And as a double digit away favorite, they've covered 64% against the spread. On the Southern Miss side, they are absolutely a fade team for me. Their only victory this year was against an FBS foe, Southeast Louisiana, who they won 35-10, but they only had an 85-yard edge. More importantly, when every college football team, it doesn't matter how bad you are, be it Kent State, be it Southern Miss, be it FIU, you come into the season and try to have a plan to get the six wins and become bowl eligible. So what happens when you're off a loss and it's your seventh loss? Well, that is a bubble burst. And like we saw in Hattiesburg, that is often the time that many coaches get fired. Once you get to seven losses and you can't get to bowl eligibility, you often fire your coach like they did on October 20th after their last loss. Now they do have an uh, interim head coach and he had a bye week, but that's not gonna phase me. Teams with seven losses off a loss that are at home as a dog of eight or more, 30 ATS wins, 51 ATS losses. That is 37% against the spread. One more system I wanna point out, and I'm gonna share the system with you just to give you another system, but it's not one that applies to this game. It's a favorite that lost back to back to back games in conference action to this opponent, including losing the last game as a favorite, and now they're a favorite of six or more. So Marshall has lost three straight to Southern Miss in the series. They lost their last game as a favorite, and they are now a favorite of six or more. Those teams since 1997 are 64.5%. The reason I said it really doesn't apply here is because these teams haven't faced each other in four or five years. So I only use that system if it is in consecutive seasons or three of the last four years, but it is a very good system to write down and check out for the rest of the games this season. And this is one of the biggest statistical mismatches of the season. You look at Southern Miss's O-line, they have been a train wreck. They have allowed 40, excuse me, 30 sacks. That's one every 14.1% of the time, either Crawford or Rodemaker, goes back to pass. You have Marshall with 22 sacks on defense. They have a sack once every 9.1 pass attempts. And when you look at Southern Miss, they allowed 15 sacks the last two games to Arkansas and to James Madison. What really stands out is this. Arkansas State, Southern Miss was at home. Arkansas State, the visitor, comes in and gets six sacks. Guess what? Mm. Arkansas State is number 112 in sacks, and they only had six total sacks in their other seven games. So they had six sacks against every other foe. They had six sacks against, against Southern Miss. And James Madison had nine sacks. And in their other three Sun Belt games, they've only had two sacks. So those are the amazing disparities showing just how bad this O-line is. Oh, yeah, by the way, Southern Miss averaging 3.5 yards per carry on offense, allowing 5.6 on defense. Marshall, averaging 4.6 on offense, allowing 3.6 on defense. We've got a yard edge on both sides. Marshall minus the points, big win. They get the bowl eligibility. They take care of it this Saturday. I love it. Marshall Southern Miss there, Ralph. And what do you got locked, loaded, ready to roll here at Wager Talking this week 11? Well, you know, VR talked about how we are VR. now have all five major winter sports. I've got a special for 30 days, guys. Save $100 off my 30 day all access. You'll get my NFL, you'll get my college football, NBA, NHL, and college hoops. $199 for 30 days. Code Ralph. 199 and that will include a 5% I have loaded in college football for this Friday.
All right, 5% ready to roll at Ralph's page at wagertalk.com. We got a few other things to get to, namely some best bets. All right, let's do it here. Best bets. And Kelly, we're going to start with you. And I guess, listen, if it ain't broke, we ain't fixing it here on the show. I could have sworn we talked about this team uh, last week, but uh, now it's a best bet for you. What are we looking at here with Texas Tech? Yeah, Joe, it is a best bet this week. And uh, look, Colorado. Hey, a lot of Buffs fans mad at me because I said that they're implied odds were exactly what they were to win the Big 12, 3.85%. So congrats to them for beating the math. I didn't say anything that was unfactual, but they seem to want to come after my head. Then this line gets marched out, Texas Tech, three and a half point underdog, and I thought, ah, it's okay. This is just going to be a short-lived thing because Texas Tech is going to win this game outright. I know that the Buffs have covered six straight. They went five and one, that one loss to Kansas State, if you remember, uh, about a month ago. Defensive line, yeah, well, they're pretty bad. And they give up a lot of sacks to Shadora Sanders, which is good news for this Texas Tech defense that if you remember last week, I kind of went on a little tangent and I said, if they win in Ames, it will be because of their defense. Texas Tech absolutely has the horses to keep up with Colorado. And that is not even up for debate. I think this game could be a real shootout, but getting those defensive stops is what Texas Tech is going to have to do to win this one at home. And I think after last week, they turned a real corner in this season, and they needed that corner turn big time. That way, of course, they can go to a bowl game, right? That was a sixth win. Those are integral things. You'll hear Ralph talk about it from now until bowl season. Becoming bowl eligible is huge for teams, especially a Joey McGuire-led team that had a little bit higher hopes this year and got humbled very, very quickly. I'm not buying the buffs. I'm definitely not buying them. Laying points here in Lubbock. Bet Texas Tech and bet them on the money line. Woo, doing it. Three and a half plus the ML on Tech here for Kelly uh, this week. Love that play. And, well, as I told you guys, it is a very special day here at Bet On It and Wager Talk. It was the birth of one Marco D'Angelo some 700 years ago. And yet here he is, alive and well. And Marco, you, my friend, in addition to a best bet, have a pretty good opportunity and celebration of your birthday for folks to hop on board. Tell us about it. Well, Joe, it is my birthday bash, a a seven-day all-access package. Normally costs $99, but... In celebration of not my 700th birthday, but I'd I'd really love to charge that price, Uh, we're going to charge $63 for a week, which is normally $99, and that'll get you every play I have for seven days, including we're going to have a 5% play this weekend, and those 5% plays have been absolute money 14-3 14-3 and the last 17 dating back to February. But, guys, it's not just the 5% plays. Uh, we are on last 12 days, an 18-7 and run with our selections up over 38 units for our clients. No better time to jump on board. We're seeing things very well. Just head over to my homepage. You can take the shortcut, wt.buzz backslash md and pick up a seven-day all-access. You don't need a coupon. It is already marked down to $63. Let's keep the winning going. And uh, speaking of winning, let's bring home a best bet this week. I haven't given you guys a total yet this year as far as a best bet, so I'm going to steal Joe's thunder and use a total for my best Mm. bet. And I'm going to look at Army in North Texas. Now, Army quarterback uh, Bryson Daly missed last week's game. That was one of the best kept secrets of the college football season because nobody found out about it till uh, shortly before game time that he was not going to play last week. And the Army offense had their lowest point production of the season, scoring just 20 points. So what makes me think anything's going to be any different this week? Because most likely he will not be playing. Well, first off, backup quarterback Dwayne Coleman, it'll be a second start. Not only will it be a second start, he will have had the reps with the first 
unit this week during practice. So I expect a better effort from him. Also, they won't be facing Air Force this week. As bad as Air Force has been this year at times, they still do one thing well. They know how to defend the option, okay? Because they see it every year from Army and from Navy and all of those military academies when they face each other generally are low scoring games. So while the public may overreact to that low scoring game last week, I'm not worried about it at all because they're going from playing Air Force that knows how to defend the option to North Texas that doesn't know how to defend anything. Everybody has been scoring on North Texas and what makes it even better is North Texas has been scoring on everybody else as well. This is a team that's gone over the total in every single game this year but one. And I see both teams going up and down the field. I don't see how they stop the Army uh, rushing game, and I don't see Army making enough stops against North Texas. North Texas has allowed on the ground in their last four games 229, 168, 207 and 297. And that was against normal offenses uh, on the ground. What are they going to do against this option? Take this one over. And oh, by the way, point wise, last three games, North Texas 37, 52, and 45 points in their last three games. And North Texas has scored 37 or more points in five straight games. Yeah, give me the over. I see this one, the total 63 and a half. I see it getting into the 70s. Give me over is my best bet for this week. All right, going up and over for Marco here with Mm -hmm. Army and North Texas. And, well, for my best bet, I am going to look to uh, some value here. And I think there is plenty of value in backing the Duke Blue Devils this week, who are coming off a 53-31 to Lost to the U last week, but let me explain something. Do not let that final score uh, give you the impression that somehow or another Duke was never in this game. It is a very misleading total, uh, which is also why I think it's going to provide some value in the market here. You've got North Carolina State that scored uh, 50 plus points against a Stanford team that uh, couldn't stop turning the ball over to them. And yet you've got a Duke team that got beat by the number four team in the country, the University of Miami. But when it comes to defense, there is no better than what Duke is bringing to the table right now. Keep in mind, they were all over <clears throat> Cam Ward in that game against Miami. Now, we all know Manny Diaz, former University of Miami defense coordinator, head coach. He's a defensive guru. He brings over Jonathan Patkey, and they run this 3-3-5, and they are just an absolute wrecking ball. They don't allow the big plays. They have a great secondary. They harass Cam Ward into uh, interceptions while also uh, having at least six tackles for a loss in that game. They were stuffing Miami in short yardage plays. Listen, this Duke defense is for real. They're going to take the short trip to North Carolina State. North Carolina State Not the same old, same old kind of defense we have gotten in years past here. But there are also three different quarterbacks now that have been going for North Carolina State here. They are not going to be able to keep up, I think, with this Duke defense. I think the defense is going to make a couple of plays in this game that is going to give Duke an opportunity not just to obviously cover, But to win this game outright, and I do, I like Duke to win the game outright. I'll take the three points. I don't think this is close. I think there's one team in Duke that is going to give themselves opportunities to win this game. I don't think NC State has the offense to be able to break through this Duke defense. Give me the Duke Blue Devils to get it done against NC State in this ACC matchup. And there you got it. What a week 11 it should be here in college football. Don't forget to hit that like button and the subscribe button and make sure that to uh, come back and join us. Don't forget Saturday's last call here on Wager Talk where you get all the steam you need in college football, 11 a.m. Eastern time. 
Kelly will be there, of course. Uh, VR will be there. We'll have a live report uh, from the Westgate uh, Sportsbook in uh, the Risk Room there. It's a great show. If you haven't seen it, even more reason why you need to go ahead and hit that subscribe button here to Wager Talk TV. Happy birthday, Marco. Always a pleasure. We'll see you for your 900th birthday again next week. In the meantime, guys, best of luck with all your plays. Let's bet on it. We'll see you again next week for week 12. Good luck.